A warm welcome to this lecture about the optimization of breeding schemes with the R package selection gain. This is part two, where I want to show you a few major results which you can easily get by using the selection gain package. When you want to know how to use the package, you should watch the film about how to use the package, the part one. My name is Friedrich Longin and I'm the head of the wheat breeding research at the University of Hohenheim, where we do a lot regarding the optimization of breeding programs. First of all, few guidelines, the copyright. This presentation can be used for internal training purposes. It's not allowed to publish it or any part of it without prior written agreement of myself. Liability. This presentation was built up carefully. Nevertheless, the author takes no liability on the correctness of any result or data shown. The target audience for this presentation are plant breeders and students in plant breeding. My background is sweet and therefore I use the package for line breeding or hybrid breeding. And I want to show you examples for hybrid wheat breeding. But to understand hybrid breeding a bit better, we should start what is line breeding and to make the difference to hybrid breeding. In line breeding, you generate new lines by the DH method, SSD or pedigree. And then you have the lines and put them in the field and test these lines in the field and their value is their per se performance, but is their value you test also in the registration trial, which is their value to be stored. Hybrid breeding. In hybrid breeding, you have a two pool concept. You have heterotic group one and group two, which form together one heterotic pattern. In both heterotic groups, you develop new lines, like in line breeding with the H method, SSD or what else. However, you are not interested in their per se value, like in line breeding, but in their combining ability to the opposite group. Because at the end, a hybrid is nothing else than a combination of two inbred lines. Thus, you produce in group one new lines, but you cross them then to a tester representative for the heterotic group two and bring them to the field trial. And there you examine the hybrids, but at the end what you are interested in are the general combining ability of the lines coming from this and this group and you select your lines based on the combining ability. That's the big difference. The target trait is the general combining ability and not anymore the line per se performance. The selection gain package optimizes breeding schemes based on the breeder's equation, the selection gain. And just to be sure that we all speak about the same thing, assume we have a trait which is influenced by many genes, a quantitative trait, and all genes have a small effect, like for grain yield. And then we get for the phenotypic values a distribution close to a normal distribution a few individuals with very poor performance, few with very good performance, and the rest, most of them, intermediate. And the selection gain would then be when we select here the best better fraction, called alpha, the selected fraction. This has a mean value, and then we subtract this mean value by the population mean. This is also called a selection differential. And we, when we multiply this difference by the heritability, we get the selection gain. However, this is a post-test selection gain. We first have to bring them to the field and evaluate them. This doesn't help me when I must know as a responsible breeder, before I put field trials in the field, which is the best strategy to do. Thus, we need a pre-test scenario where we predict the genetic selection gain. And this is done by the well-known breeder equation. And the breeder equation is in details t 
the selection intensity multiplied by the square root of the heritability multiplied by the square root of the variance of the target rate, for instance, grain yield, and divided by the number of years required to finish one breeding cycle. This is then the annual selection gain, while the absolute selection gain would be the same formula without the division by the number of years required to finish the cycle. Directly looking at this formula, it's quite easy to know how selection gain is maximized. Just naively, we have to increase E or H or sigma Y or we have to reduce Y. Thus we should have a more intensive selection by testing more lines, for instance, should have a higher heritability by having, for instance, more test locations, a higher genetic variance, or we speed up the breeding cycle and have a faster breeding cycle. This is quite ridiculous to th speak about, but this will impact all our discussions in the next slides. First, let's look how could we increase the selection intensity. And selection intensity is a function of the selected fraction, which is alpha and which is at the end in the number of selected lines divided by the number of tested lines. And you see here, this is the selected fractions. We assume we select one, the very best lines, out of 200, 400, 600, 800 or 1000. And on the y-axis you see the selection intensity. And what is very important to see is that the increase, the selection intensity, with increasing uh, number of tested lines or decreasing selected fraction in this case, is by far not linear. It's more asymptotic. That means an increase from 0 to 200 lines here is of tremendous importance because the selection intensity is tremendously increased. But increasing from 600 to 800 is still increasing selection intensity by but very little. To summarize, selection intensity is increased by increasing the number of tested lines or vice versa, decreasing the number of selected lines. And the most important is to notice, but this increase is not linear. Let's look to the heritability. Heritability is nothing else than the genetic variance divided by the phenotypic variance. And an example for a phenotypic variance is given here. This could be the genetic variance plus the G genetic by environment interaction variance, which is divided by the number of test locations we use, plus the error variance, which is divided by the product of the test locations and replications we use. And these variance components we can easily get out of our breeders' trials. When we test our advanced lines and yield trials, you can get these variance components out. And we see here in this figure now the heritability on the y-axis, independence of the number of test locations in this solid curve, or in a dotted curve, independence of the number of replications. And what we easily can notice with an increasing of number of locations and replications, heritability increases. But we have here two major points we see in a simple, in this simple graph already, which we should absolutely keep in mind. First is, look at the curve of the number of replications and compare it to the curve number of test locations. The heritability is much more improved by increasing the number of test locations than replications. And this is due to the effect when we look at the phenotypic variance here. The number of test locations reduce the G by E interaction variance and the error variance, 
while the number of replications only affect the error variance. Thus, assuming that a replication costs as much money as a test location, which is often the case when a breeding company has different uh, a network of different field locations belonging to this company, then another location doesn't cost more than my home location. In this scenario, it's all time more worthy to invest in number of locations than in number of replications. And the second thing is also, like seen in selection intensity, the curve, the heritability is not linearly increasing with the number of test locations. At the beginning, it's tremendously increasing, while it rapidly flattens. Thus, heritability is increased by increasing the number of locations or increasing the number of replications. But the replications have a less strong impact than the number of locations on the heritability. And the increase in heritability is not linear to the number of increased locations or replications. Let's look at the allocation of resources and how they impact the selection gain formula. We have the number of lines we produce and test and select at the end. These enter the selection intensity by the fact that the selected fraction is calculated by the finally selected lines divided by the number of tested lines. While the number of test locations and replications enters in the phenotypic variance and thus in the heritability. That both have an influence on the uh, expected selection gain in my breeding program. Thus one idea is with the package and this is the really cool thing of the selection gain package that you have already uh, a package you just need to put few input parameters and then the optimization is done for you. You don't need to program loops for numbers of locations, replications, it's already done. Thus, the target criteria is to maximize your selection gain in a given scenario you define by optimizing different variables. And this is the optimal number of locations, replications, lines, and in hybrid breeding also tester, and you can even deal with tester type, and for sure splitting of lines and crosses and lines within crosses. But the last point is yet not able to be done in the package. But for all, the most important thing is we assume that we have a fixed annual budget, which is full reality to our uh, thinking. A plant breeder like me, I have a budget for my program each year and I should spend all of it and therefore we define here in the optimizations and in the comparison of breeding schemes a fixed budget because we cannot compare a breeding scheme where I invest double the money than the other one. That is not a fair comparison. And looking on the budget, we should also keep another thing in mind, which is quite logical, but sometimes forgotten. I have here, for instance, shown an easy pedigree scheme with the traits we select on the allocation of resources, some specific nurseries, and the seed production and stock. And my budget, what I have in my breeding program, is this horizontal budget to finish one breeding cycle. For instance, when I get 1 million euro, I have 1 million euro to finish one run here through the system. But this means that I have also an annual budget of 1 million euro because I don't have only this year the crosses, next year the F1, I have several programs in parallel. I have the crosses which I start this year, but I have also the F1 of the last year's start of the program, and the F2 of two years ago start of the program, and the F3 of three years ago start of the program. That's all the horizontal operations I have in parallel from other breeding cycles, but I have in parallel. And thus, my budget I have annually is also the budget which is necessary to finish 
one greeting cycle. Just to keep this in mind when we design our breeding scheme to run an optimization. And we could derive now a very simple budget formula would be the cost for producing the lines and the cost for testing the lines with the number of lines, the number of locations, replications, and when we have hybrids, testers as well. Let's stick back to the assumption that we know the breeders equation is increased when we increase selection intensity and heritability. And as we have learned, the more lines we invest, the higher is our selection intensity. And we have learned as well, the more locations and or replications we used, the higher is our heritability. But we have now the assumption that we have a fixed budget. And that means a maximization of the selection gain represents a compromise between a high number of test candidates and a high intensity of testing. These are contradictory uh, aims. We have to find a compromise for it. And therefore, I would define a golden rule. The most important thing having selection intensity and heritability in mind is that the curves of them level off. That the, once again, the increase is not linear. That is in this region, only large increases in the number of lines will deliver small increase in selection intensity. While when you are in this region here, each change in the number of lines will tremendously increase or decrease your selection intensity. That means, if possible, avoid to be here, be in this region. And similar, similarly for, for the heritability, you see here a region where it's not that more increasing than here at the beginning. And important is having fixed costs and assuming that the replication costs as much as the other location, the use of unreplicated trials is all the time optimum. It's just a matter of budget. Thus we have now looked on the variable selection intensity and heritability and how they can impact selection gain. Let's look at the years which are required to finish one breeding cycle. And for sure to increase the selection gain, it would be desirable to reduce the number to finish this cycle. And just an example, let's assume hybrid breeding in wheat. We have a phenotypic scheme here. We produce the H lines, make a hybrid seed production, put them in the field test, select the better ones, make once again hybrid seed production with new testers and make a second yield test. And we compare a breeding scheme where we use genomic selection and we assume we make a genomic selection directly after nursery before the hybrid seed production starts because it's very expensive hybrid seed production in wheat. And we further assume that this genomic selection is as good as roughly a yield test. And thus we say using genomic selection, we can uh, uh, stick only to one year field testing. And in this case, we would be two years faster than the phenotypic standard scheme. Let's make a very easy example. Let's assume selection intensity equals 2, the square root of the heritability equals 0.7, which is quite close to reality in, for yield. We have a, a standard deviation for grain yield of 5 decitons a hectare. And then we have for the phenotypic scheme, we just multiply selection intensity by square root of the heritability by the variant, the standard deviation of the target trait and divided by the number of years to finish the cycle, which would be seven in this case. And then we get an annual selection gain of one. Let's go to the GS scheme. If we have the same input parameter here and we divide it by the years we require there, two years less, it's five, 
that would be we have an annual selection gamma of 1.4. That would be a 40% higher annual selection gain. This is quite an easy example and not really reality. But I just want to show you with this example that the number of years have a tremendous large effect on the determination of the annual selection gain. And you can just imagine from a more practical point of view, when you come up with a variety which is extraordinary in performance, but unfortunately your competitor had the same luck one year before you and entered registration trials one year earlier with a similar variety. Although you are now with your new variety better than the Czechs, but you are one year behind the other, the market is gone to the other. That might, you must be faster than your competitor. The winner takes all. But speed up has also a, a second side of the medal. Let's have a look at variance components and the impact of the year. I have taken this example from a publication of Leidig et al, which have looked at a registration trial in Germany for winter wheat, winter barley, grain maize, forage maize, winter oil seal rape, sugar beet and others, but I have taken only them. And we have the variance components due to genotypic variants, genotype by location interaction, genotype by year interaction, genotype by location by year interaction and environmental error. And what we rapidly see is that the components, the variance components with the year interaction and with the location and year interaction has an important size as compared with the other ones and especially with the genetic variance components. That does mean that the ranking of the varieties differs from year to year, which is also a thing I guess you already recognized regularly in your program. Or here an example from my trials in winter durum trial just the ranking of the lines in the yield test 2016 from 1 to 20 you see here that the uh, very good lines in 2016 had been quite poor in 2015 and vice versa these lines have been quite good in 2015 and poor in 2016. So we should be aware when we speed up and especially go out of the field to genomics, we, we have less information on stability and we have to think about how we can deal with stability. Furthermore, when we have natural occurring diseases, the less we are in the field, the higher is the probability that we test in a year where we don't see the disease and we get the negative surprises in the registration trials or even later when we launch the variety when it's getting really expensive. Or frost. The last years we had even on uh, 1000 meter height frost tests difficulties to measure frost. Or when we have drought and heat. I mean, the speed of a program is also a compromise between a maximum annual selection gain and the maximum risk I want to take to be sure that I have not, uh, that I have accounted for the variation in the years and variation in the diseases and specific effects like frost, drought and heat occurring unregularly. Thus, we can easily say, looking at the formula of selection gain, how to increase the selection gain, but at the end, a compromise is necessary between the parameters and between theory and practice. But it's really important that you keep in mind facts uh, on selection intensity, square root of the heritability and the effect of the number of years of a breeding cycle. Because this can also already answer quite a lot of questions to you before running a simulation of a breeding program. When we want to stick the use of molecular markers, especially now in the era of genomic selection, is getting more interesting. 
We can also deal with the package of the selection gain package in R just using another formula here or just a modification. We don't have the heritability here. We have here the correlation between the genomic breeding value and the target variable. And when we look at the formula, we can already answer an uh, important question. A correlation cannot be larger than one. That means normally the correlation coefficient is smaller than one. Thus, using an indirect criterion will reduce your selection gain. Yes, but we could still improve it. If, for instance, the use of this technology like genomic selection offers us the possibility to increase the in parallel the selection intensity or the genetic variance or to reduce the number of years required for a breeding cycle. But using an indirect criterion has a drawback and is only beneficial when it has additional positive effects. And when we look now on the implementation of genomic selection, what we need is a, at the end we need a correlation between the observed and predicted breeding value. So here the genomic predicted breeding value of a population and here the phenotypic breeding value and then we get a R square and R uh, correlation value and this is what we require to run a simulation. Be aware that prediction accuracy strictly speaking is this correlation divided by the square root of the heritability. Thus when taking uh, prediction accuracy estimates to the software package selection gain really look whether they have the prediction ability or whether you have to do standard to, to uh, calculate it based with the heritability. And when we use genomic selection we need for sure this correlation between genomic and phenomic breeding value in our case would be the GCA, the general combining ability for grain yield and we need to know costs for genomic selection. And I want to show you a few results which are based on these two publications here for hybrid wheat. Let's assume a phenotypic breeding scheme. We produce the age lines and we cross them after this production and the nursery evaluation, we cross them to a number of testers from the opposite pool and bring them to a field test. And once again, select the very best lines out and produce with additional tests or new hybrid combinations and put them once again in the field. And then after seven years, the breeding cycle is finished. They will be put to pre-registration trials, but you as responsible breeder, you will start new cycles. And we could now imagine that we use genomic selection, but as we are not very confident, for instance, in it, or we want just to test it beside the normal strategy, we can say we don't change anything. We just put genomic selection here inside. That means in, in the nursery or after nursery, we once again select uh, on genomic breeding values and the selected fraction we put into hybrid seed production. This was calculated in this publication here. You see here the maximum annual selection gain for different prediction accuracies for genomic selection, which are increasing here from 0 0.1 to 0 0.9. The line is the selection, annual selection gain for the phenotypic standard scheme, which doesn't change uh, uh, due to the prediction accuracy because it does not use genomic selection. In contrast, the circles here, the triangles, you have a slight increase in the annual selection gain with an increase of the prediction accuracy for genomic selection, which is quite logical because this breeding scheme uses a one-step genomic selection approach. That means the higher the prediction accuracy, the larger is the advantage of genomic selection breeding schemes. However, the actual situation for unpredicted hybrids where we don't have phenotypic GCA values already, 
we assume that the prediction accuracy is here around 0.3. And in this scenario, we don't see an advantage of the genomic reading scheme over the phenotypic reading scheme. And therefore, I would suggest thinking a bit more in consequence. We heard already uh, in introduction of an indirect criterion here. Will not increase direct selection gain if we don't increase anything else in parallel. For instance, a higher number of lines we could test. Or if we say this genomic selection is as good as a one-year yield test and we can uh, test only one year in the field. So reduce the cycle length. And if we are even more keen on genomic selection, we can assume our genomics are so good now, we don't need to go anymore in the field. We do make a genomic selection and then we go directly to pre-registration trials. And this would speed up the breeding cycle by four years, which would be a really tremendous change. And we calculate this once again. We see once again the prediction accuracy from genomic selection increasing from 0 0.1 to 0 0.9. And here the maximum annual selection gain. The line once again is the phenotypic standard scheme. The open triangles are the scheme where we use genomic selection, but we don't change the breeding scheme at all. The black triangles are that where we say use of genomic selection is so good that we only go once to field tests. And for this scenario, we see irrespective of the prediction accuracy from genomic selection, this breeding scheme has a higher annual selection gain than the phenotypic breeding scheme. For the scheme where we assume we only make genomic selection and we don't go anymore in the field, we see a very strong slope due to the prediction accuracy from genomic selection, which is quite logical. It fully depends on this prediction accuracy. But we see the thing that uh, it gets only interesting when we have a prediction accuracy higher than 0.5, while below it's poorer than the other schemes. Thus, genomic selection appears promising for crane yield in hybrid wheat breeding, especially when we use to shorten the breeding cycle length. And when we now look at the scenario once again, that we assume that the prediction accuracy of 0.3 across cycles on lines where we don't have any GCA information is reality. The use of the genomic selection rapid breeding scheme is of high interest because we get a 35% higher annual selection gain than the phenotypic uh, breeding scheme. And 35% is really a big amount of advantage. At least in registration trials in Germany, we have roughly a yield advantage, an annual yield advantage of the new lines entering the registration trials of about 1%. And 35% would mean this is a 35% year advantage. That's it's really a big issue. Thus, we see that a genomic selection only scheme, where we only look on genomics and don't go anymore to the field, is not of interest, taking the, the low prediction accuracies from genomic selection for crane yield into account but a breeding scheme where we use one stage of genomic selection and one stage of phenotypic selection is really interesting. But let's ask the question, this was a particular situation, one situation of budget, one situation of variance components, and a situation of very high hybrid seed production costs, which are at least actual, the reality in Pratweed. And for that scenario, we calculated the different proposals and we expressed here the selection gain, the annual selection gain in the GS rapid breeding scheme in relation to the phenotypic standard scheme. That means 100% is the selection gain from the phenotypic selection. And we did it for high budget, 10,000 would be roughly a half million euro 
we made it for a small budget, 3,000, that would be 150,000 euro. We see still an advantage of over 35%. And then we doubled the error variance component. That means we had a much lower uh, narrow sense heritability and nevertheless we get even more a higher um, a selection gain of almost 140 percent in the genomic breeding scheme and when we quadru quadrupled the hybrid seed production assuming they are much cheaper even then gs rapid stayed over 30 percent more with annual selection gain than the phenotypic breeding scheme that means the use of genomic selection in elite breeding is recommended for a broad range of scenarios and also for small programs. And we did this also calculate not for hybrid wheat, but also for hybrid ray, rye, hybrid triticale, hybrid barley. And it appears to be quite robust that the breeding scheme using one stage of genomic selection and using this genomic selection to re reduce the cycle length by one year of fe uh, yield phenotyping is really worth to be taken into account. To put this in even more stronger background, here you have the annual selection gain. And we see here the phenotypic standard scheme, assuming a big budget of a half a million euro, we get 0.8 annual selection gain. When we use, and for the same budget, the GS rapid scheme, we get 35% higher grain yield, uh, higher selection gain. This we know already. But using the scheme and using only a third of the budget, we are still better than the phenotypic uh, standard selection. It means 30% of the budget is used and we still are 7.6% higher in annual selection gain than in a phenotypic standard scheme. That shows for me on the one hand, the interest in this breeding scheme for applied plant breeding in a broad context. Furthermore, it highlights once again the importance to make really optimization of breeding schemes under fixed budget and compare the best situation of a fixed scenario of a fixed breeding scheme with the best scenario uh, in another uh, breeding scheme. And then we get a fair comparison and can make meaningful conclusions to design our backbone, our breeding scheme. Thus, to conclude, the optimization of the breeding program is quite forward with the R package selection gain with low requirements to computing power. And you don't need many input variables, you are quite fast and you get meaningful results. And important, you have as a breeder only a fixed budget and thus the best allocation it's always a compromise and therefore you will get figures with this package to avoid regions where you are outside each compromise to get really the optimum for you. Close to its optimum, the allocation of resources can be chosen relatively flexible, but too low numbers of test candidates and test locations must be avoided. And even for loud genomic selection prediction accuracies, the implementation of GS appears promising, but only when it's used to speed up the program. But up to my knowledge and what we have seen now yet in simulation is that the prediction accuracies, when they are that low across breeding cycles, a genomics based only breeding strategy cannot be recommended. With this, that I hope I have shown you a bit interesting results and interesting possibilities to deal with the selection gain package R. You can use this presentation to rebuild with the R package the results that you get familiar, that you understand the code and that you can check yourself in the results that you have done like you want to do and then you can run your own simulations. And when you still have questions, don't hesitate to contact me by phone, by email or however. Thanks a lot.